So um, this, is, this is very much connected, this program very much connected to an exhibition that we have on our third floor, um, which is open, and perhaps you'll decide to go visit it after the program. It's called Until Everyone Has It Made, Jackie Robinson's Legacy. Um, 71 years ago, um, come April 15th, five days from now, uh, Robinson broke the baseball color line when the Brooklyn Dodgers started him at first base, April 15th, 1947. Um, since then, there have been all sorts of uh, activists, intersections between activism and sports, commentary around racism through sports act activism, and that's what we're talking about um, tonight. Um, it's important, we feel, at the Brooklyn Historical Society um, to tell this history um, and to understand this history, not for abstract reasons, but really for reasons that inform news today. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the two wonderful um, writers and thinkers who are going to be in conversation about this topic tonight and then ask them to come up to the stage. Rembert Brown has drawn notice for his wide variety of work in sports, pop culture, and politics. From interviewing President Obama on the 50th anniversary of the Selma March, to serving as a moderator of the Iowa Democratic Brown and Black Presidential Forum during the 2016 U.S. presidential campaign, to reporting on the ground in Ferguson, to writing profiles on Donald Glover and Ryan Kugler and Colin Kaepernick, to writing a comic in ta Coates' Black Panther World of Wakanda series. Previously, Rembert was a staff writer, writer for Grantland, then a writer at large at New York Magazine. He hails from Atlanta, Georgia, and currently lives in Brooklyn. He will be in conversation with Dave Zirin. Dave Zirin was named one of the 50 visionaries who are changing our world by Utney Magazine. He is the sports editor of The Nation and author of now, I believe, nine books, but many books, let's just say, um, including his most recent, which you may have seen as you came in just out, Things That Make White People Uncomfortable with Michael Bennett. Um, Zyron is a frequent guest on ESPN, MSNBC, and Democracy Now. He also hosts the nation's Edge of Sports podcast and the collision with Aton Thomas and Dave Zyron on WPFW in DC. So please help me welcome Rembert and Dave. How's everybody doing? You all right? All right. Well, welcome everybody to this event. We're going to talk about the intersection of sports and politics and also make sure there's plenty of time if folks have questions for us. Uh, first, just a point of, of clarification, just so everybody knows, I'm Dave. This is Rembert. So that's perfectly clear. And second of all, this is the first time we've ever met. So yeah, we, we met 20 minutes ago. It was great. We are like... We, I texted Killer Mike, and he freaked out that I was on a panel with Dave. Uh, which and then is, Dave freaked out, almost fainted before the panel started. I did. So this is cool. <laughs> Hence my drink. Um, so, so this is interesting. So it's almost like you guys are watching a first get-together, first date, first what have you, between two people who have read each other's stuff over the years and who have never actually met or spoken to one another. So this should be interesting. So, Rembert, how you doing? I'm wonderful. It is Tuesday. Um, <laughs> my girlfriend bought me this cardigan, and uh, I'm really excited to talk. Yeah, shout out to girlfriends. Um, and uh, I, uh, I'm excited to just see what you throw at me, and then I'm going to throw stuff. Yeah. Hit, hit me with something. I'll start with the, 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 hoodie. the sweatshirt that I have here, which was a gift from uh, John Carlos, 1968 Olympian. It's got his signature on the side, and if you look really closely, 
right here, it's got his uh, little shadow. It's a flex. Yeah, it's a little cool thing. And, um, and John Carlos is an absolute hero of mine and a friend. And we have a common friend here in the front row, which is, makes me very happy. What's up, man? <laughs> and so a big shout out, because it's the 50th anniversary of the 1968 Olympics when they raised their fists to the heavens. And that should be noticed yes. and recognized. But we're here less to talk about the past than to talk about the present and the future, mm -hmm. particularly of this wave of activist athletes that we are seeing uh, in this country right now. And it's something that if you're roughly my age and grew up a sports fan in like the 1990s and the aughts, it, this is a, a rather shocking development to see political athletes in such numbers and such width and at high schools and, uh, and you see cheerleaders taking a knee during yeah. the anthem, soccer players taking a knee during the anthem. My favorite was the, the school band, they're playing the Star Spangled Banner and the Zuzaphone player took a <laughs> knee while playing the Zuzaphone and I'm telling you, that took more athleticism than anything that happened on that field. It's, it's a heavy it's, instrument. Yeah, seriously. So, so th there's a lot of very uh, in interesting and incredible developments. So my first question, for, for you, Rembert, is when do you first, when did it first occur to you that something different was happening? That this wasn't the same old, same old, that you have this new kind of organic development of political athletes? Because I know you started writing uh, for, for like mass publication like 2010, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you started your blog 2008, right? I started, I started a blog in 2010, started at Grantland 2011. Right, so yeah. you're at this time that I would argue is before this yeah. wave begins. And also pre, you had to be on Twitter. Yes. It's like a pre, like this is pre hashtag universe, you know? When we all had our mental health. Yeah. yeah. Yes. When we, were, when we were all sane. Yes. Um, so for me, I, you know, I, I won't, I would never say this is the beginning, but, um, you know, I really give a lot of credit to LeBron. But also, mm -hmm. like, LeBron, I feel like activism somehow brought LeBron and Carmelo together mm -hmm. in, a, in a weird way. Like they, they had often been, like, you know, LeBron was going this way. LeBron, like, Carmelo was only get, going this way in New York, but was going kind of this way everywhere else. But um, <laughs> just in terms of, like, their cultural relevancy. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, like, the, the one thing that I will say about LeBron was that you know, there have always been big, there, there have always been activists in sports. Mm -hmm. um, it had been a long time since you had a Bill Russell slash Kareem Abdul-Jabbar level athlete in their sport be outspoken. Mm -hmm. It had often been people more on the fringes, people who weren't, didn't have all the endorsements, blah, blah, blah. Like, and watching LeBron kind of be like, wait, you know, like kind of understand that like what he does his league will follow mm -hmm. which is true like and that's i think that's true in his peers and also like the young kids coming up like lebron sets the tone for the nba mm -hmm. and that's not <clears throat> we haven't seen that and so watching that happen from an athlete that you know had always been compared to jordan like this was clearly like you know, the fork in the road mm -hmm. where he was like, well, yes, y'all can mess with our stats forever, but like this is one world in which like we can never be compared about. And I mm. thought that was, um, you know, from the stuff with Trayvon to, you know, like I mean, there, there's lots of stuff. You mean, I mean, he called, he called Trump a bum. It was like the greatest moment that's ever happened on Twitter. Um, and uh, yes, you should clap for that. That was the greatest thing I've ever seen. Um, but, you know, like, I think for a lot of just normal people, but athletes especially, they worry about how their honest feelings are going to impact their futures and their money mm -hmm. and their careers and you know, how, how they're perceived by their fans. And LeBron, mm -hmm. like, LeBron, like, lost, like, clearly lost fans and lost, like, this was my guy, and then he does this, and they're like, you know, he, but he's, he's forcing his entire fan base to reckon with this thing that wasn't supposed to happen with the stick-to-sports crowd. Mm -hmm. And, exactly. and that's such a powerful thing for a person with influence to do 
to, um, to make all their fans make that decision. Are you going to stick with me mm -hmm. or are you going to jump from the bandwagon? And I, I, that's mm -hmm. something that LeBron did that I feel like doesn't like really only like culturally resonates often when you're someone of that stature. Wow. I, just for the record, to me, the greatest moment on Twitter is when the, uh, and you guys should have your own moments that you share with us, but it was when the, the Parkland student said, uh, how's Marco Rubio like an AR-15? They're both for sale. Um, that, was, <laughs> that was a great moment. Love the teens. Uh, yes, love, <laughs> love Generation Z. Um, it's interesting, you mentioned LeBron. I started writing about the politics of sports uh, in 2003, and that was the year LeBron James came into the NBA. And, um, and I was charting him like everybody was, because he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated, I think in 2001 or 2002 as a high school junior. So the expectations for LeBron were already off the page. Oh, two, yeah. Oh, two. I, the, I, my, my, my high school basketball team was at that point, Owen 17. So I remember when that issue came out, because my mom like left it on my doorstep. Dude. <laughs> and she was like, Dude. you ain't. <laughs> Continue. My, my high school basketball team was called the Fighting Quakers, so I don't have much to, to go on. Not exactly intimidating. Um, and so I was, I was charting him very closely, and he did this interview, and I'm, I'm still so, so embarrassed uh, about this column I wrote about it, but like he did this interview where he talked about his goals in being a professional athlete, and he said that his goals were to be uh, the wealthiest athlete who ever lived and to be a global icon like Muhammad Ali. And I wrote this column where I said, well, you know what, those are two fine goals, but they aren't goals that go together because Ali became a global icon for what he sacrificed, not for what he earned. And at some point, LeBron James is going to have to make a choice. Is it going to be being a mogul, or is it going to be standing up and being that Ali-type figure? And I think what, what he has shown is that he can be this kind of mogul-type figure while also not checking his politics at the door. Yeah. And he's created a whole new template for this generation of athletes. Like, I agree with you about that, that LeBron is where it starts. And to me, it's about the collision of LeBron James and social media in yeah. terms of explaining it's like, what like, we it's have. Like he didn't financially code switch. Right. Like, like <laughs> that, it's almost like that. Like, he's like, LeBron's always been black, but like, you know, there's, there's a world in which, like, once you get to a financial threshold, you're right. supposed to just, like, not say anything ever again. Yeah, and there are all of these quotes that you can find online from Michael Jordan, for example, who says, he's saying things like, I may be black, but my goal is to just be treated like a human being, or I'm a human being first, uh, not black. Civil rights matter to my father's generation, not to mine. And LeBron James has... Republic Republicans. Buy sneakers, too, yeah. being the most... Yeah. Iconic one. Iconic one. And, and here's LeBron James saying explicitly, like, it doesn't matter what you earn, you are still black in a racist, white supremacist society, and speaking very directly about that. And it, it, it's amazing, because I, I got to bring it back to Brooklyn, if I could, just very quick, because like, if pe people might have seen about LeBron James had a racial epithet scrawled on his house in California last spring, and that's where he spoke like, like beautifully at this press conference about like being famous doesn't insulate you from racism, having money does not insulate you from racism. And he said he was going public about it, and he said he was going public about it because of the example of Emmett Till's mother. And, and speaking about, this is what Emmett Till's mother did in terms of having the open casket funeral for her son. And, and he said, that, that's the legacy that I want to see myself in, is actually exposing this racism to the broader world. And then he did a shout out to, to, to the book that just came out. Um, I'm blanking on it. The, the Death of Emmett Till, The Murder of Emmett Till. It's a recent book about Emmett yeah. Till. And um, it's on my shelf. It's an amazing book. And, it's like, you might ask yourself, why is LeBron James talking about Emmett Till in this book? And it's because Dave Chappelle started a little book club with LeBron where they're reading the book together. <laughs> now, why is Dave Chappelle so political? Well, he had two very political parents. And one of those parents worked closely with a guy named Mark Nason, who is the author of books like Communists in Harlem and is a New York's longtime New York City radical dude. So it all comes 
kind of full circle. And one of the things that made uh, radicalize Mark Nason was learning about the Communist Party and how they organized to integrate Major League Baseball in the 1930s. And there is a big poster in this very historical society, three floors up, of marches in the 1930s to integrate baseball that were held by the New York Communist Party. So you see it goes from there yeah. to Nason, to Chappelle, to LeBron, to us. That's pretty cool. Which I, you know, which I think is like a really good, I'm gonna back this up, thanks all of my, my grill. Um, <laughs> um, I think that's something you said is like a really amazing, like comparing Chappelle and like, Ch Chappelle and LeBron. It's like a really interesting colliding of worlds because, um, and I told you, I told you backstage, like, like I, I wrote about all, like half of last year, I wrote about Kaepernick, and one thing that I had to come to terms with was, the like, the like the fact, but also the like how impressed I was that mm. Kaepernick had had this wild, I won't, I, I don't want to call it an awakening, but had allowed the world to be thrust on him and to like mm -hmm. shoulder it as someone who hadn't been raised to be like like a leader of black people mm -hmm. you know like like i know a lot about Chappelle, and based off of his upbringing like his parents raised him to like make the world better for black people like which is the same as me like my my mother is a, is a black psychologist that taught at the AUC, at the uh, Atlanta University Center, you know, Morehouse, mm -hmm. Spellman, um, Morris Brown, and... You said your family was preachers and teachers. Preachers right? and teachers, that's my family, you know, mm -hmm. Atlanta, Georgia, you know, Atlanta, Detroit, Chicago, D.C., New York, like, that's the, that's the belt line, and um, so, while sometimes, you know, I'm glad that I, you know, I, I continue to do what I was raised to do, it was always built into me in a way that it, ne it wasn't necessarily for someone like Kaepernick. And mm -hmm. I think someone like LeBron, it was like, who knows at what point in his life this was, you know, the highest priority. Mm -hmm. So to see someone like him take it on as like, like there are things that need to happen for this to, to maximize his influence. And one of those things is like, you know, reading the right things and interacting with the right people that are gonna talk, sit you down and talk to you. And like, like, the fact that LeBron is in a book club with Dave Chappelle is like more important, like, if, if you were like, who is the one person you want LeBron to talk to race about? It's Dave yeah. Chappelle, you right. know? Like, there's no one else. There's no one else alive I want talking to LeBron about, you know? Mm. And um, so yeah, like that, that parallel with someone like, Kaepernick, who was often in those, um, in that year and a half where people were often like, he's not saying anything. Like, mm -hmm. what's he hiding from? Like, 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 what is he saying that like he doesn't want us to know? It's like, like let the man catch up. Mm -hmm. You know, let the man read some stuff. Let the man meet some people who have been thinking about this stuff their entire lives so he can make a full argument like even if your heart is in the right place once you start opening your mouth who knows what's gonna happen you know right. like I, I thought that five minutes before I walked on the stage but um <laughs> but like my heart's always in the right place but like like I'm thankfully like I can fall back on a lifetime of education right you know that's not everyone's upbringing and which is one of the many reasons you know just like you know talking about other athletes, like one of the many reasons I'm impressed by him because mm -hmm. he has played, he has had to play such a wild uh, degree of catch up that. You see, I love the origin stories of these athletes who are speaking out and be, being political right now because they're, they're all ending up at this same place where, and, and it's interesting, like wh whether you interview somebody like Russell Westbrook or Maya Moore, uh, or Colin Kaepernick or LeBron James, they actually say very similar things. If people get a book called We Matter, Athletes and Activism by Atan Thomas where he interviews a ton of these folks, 
they say very similar things about why they're speaking out. They're saying, we have this platform, racism is real, we have to do something about it. Like, it's all very straight up. We have the platform, we have to do something about it. But how they got to this point, it's as truly diverse as the actuality of the black community in this country itself. So you've got LeBron James, um, who at one point was sleeping in a car growing up. Yeah. So it's like he knows poverty in a way that's in his bones. You've got Colin Kaepernick, who was not just adopted by a white family, but by a very wealthy white family and living in the suburbs. And now he's putting out reading lists that are about black feminism and intersectionality as a way so people can understand his development. Yeah. So it wasn't from living in a car, it was from, from reading like the, these incredible authors and, and coming to a different kind of consciousness, reading Angela Davis and, and then debating it with people in his circle. And then you have someone like Maya Moore, who I interviewed. She's, by the way, if you don't know who she is, she's on the Mount Rushmore of basketball players. Legendary. I mean, a legendary basketball player. And Maya Moore has been doing incredible work on criminal justice reform. It's like, how did she do that? Well, she happened to grow up in a church where people in the church were doing mentoring work with people in prison, and they started talking to people who were like, why are they behind bars? Why is this happening? And talking to people who they believe were innocent, who were just locked away under our system of mass incarceration, and now she speaks out um, for sentencing laws and against mandatory minimums. And so they've all arrived at this very similar place while coming from very different places. And that, that fascinates me. And I also think it speaks to why these outspoken black athletes, why they piss Donald Trump off so much, and why they seem to get under his skin in a way that, say, George Clooney doesn't, or even white sports figures like Greg Popovich, who called Trump a soulless coward. You know, it's like there's something about that because they're speaking, they're speaking against erasure when what? they're speaking so, out. So, like, think about this, like, and I, I, you know, I would never claim to have noticed this first, but I saw it on my timeline. Someone pointed out that um, this was when um, all the stuff was happening with uh, Jamel Hill yeah. and ESPN. You know, lots of people had come after Trump. Mm -hmm. Lots of famous people, lots of, um, and, but like the same week, I think, I think it was the same week that the New Yorker literally put like, like a Trump sailboat Klansman mm -hmm. on, like on on their cover, and there were no tweets about that. Jamel tweeted Jamel, an ESPN employee, uh, ESPN, uh, ABC, you know, Disney, whatever mm -hmm. employee, tweeted something about Trump, and Trump dove all of his energy into this black woman, mm -hmm. and it's like it's not it's. It's clear that it's like the people that piss them off. It's not the um, it's it's it, it it's not the outlet. It's not like how many mm -hmm. readers. It's not you know the viewers. It's like what type of people should be scared of him or mm -hmm. should respect him uh, or should like I, I don't even think it's like the type of people who should look up to him or anything mm -hmm. like that. I think it's more like the people like. You're not supposed to be able to talk bad about someone like him and continue to have a career. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you can like diss Donald Trump, the president, and have no worries about your own livelihood mm -hmm. is the thing that I think keeps him, you know, writing tweet drafts at. 2.15 in the morning. I mean, executive you know, time. You know, you know, just like, just freaking out, yeah. you know? And I, because we're supposed to be, people like that are supposed to be, like, like, they're supposed to be putting their careers on the line mm -hmm. to fight back at him, when in, when in actuality, they're not. Well, see, it, it gave the game away to me, where you have these athletes who are staging protests during the anthem as a way to raise the question of police violence and racial inequity. You know, that's why they did it. And if you want to make some of these athletes a little upset, say, so tell me about the anthem protests. And they say, wait a minute, it's not an anthem protest because we weren't protesting the anthem. Frankly, I, I personally think there are some very good reasons to protest the anthem, but they, they, would, they, they draw that line very sharply 
and say we're not protesting the anthem, we're staging a protest during the anthem to raise the issue of the gap between what this country says it represents and our lived experience as black Americans. And that's what we're trying to do. And for Trump to take that and say this is an attack on America, I mean, seriously, you don't have to be Al Sharpton to figure out what he's doing in terms of trying to redirect this discussion away from speaking about the lived experience of black Americans and turning it to something about like, are you on the side of America or not? I mean, he has taken the national anthem and turned it into a, this kind of partisan issue yeah. where you have to pick this side. And that's been, I think, an incredible strain on athletes who wanted to have one kind of a discussion and instead are forced to have another. Which is, you know, like, at the end, one of the great moments of, I, I wrote about, I wrote about, I wrote a profile on Kaepernick and the, the piece actually got pushed back a couple of weeks because I had the opportunity to um, go to a Seahawks Green Bay game and like just get some locker room time with Michael Bennett and who was like, it was like the coda on the piece. It was like, I was mm -hmm. like, it doesn't have to happen, but it'll make the piece so much better because it, it's like the moment like it's all, it's all, it was it was a it was, this was Labor Dayish last year, so it was almost like a passing of the baton moment for like mm -hmm. the player who's gonna be in the league next year type thing. Mm -hmm. um, this like, was week it, one of the NFL season, right? This was week one. Yeah. yeah. And but like, as someone who is, you know, written a book with him, like, what, what is what is that? What is yeah? Uh, what is that? You know what has that process been like? Because like you know, I got him for I got him for for six minutes, and I was like, I, I I wish I could talk to him about everything that's because it, it's clear oh, just like everything was going on in his brain. Yeah. Um, in terms of you know wanting to, and and for me, and I you know I don't know him as well as you do, but in my mind, like there were. Kaepernick, like, was a non-superstar, non-100% non black, not even in the league person doing this. Like, I, I got this sense from Michael being like, y'all, like, y'all can't come at me with all these other things. Like, I can be, like, as hyper black and whatever as possible. I'm aware my, you know, I'm going to just be whoever I want to be, and I'm not going to concede to y'all. Like, it was, I was like, oh, this is... This is phase two. Oh, Michael didn't care. Michael thrust his hips after a sack and said he's doing it because he wants to raise the birth rate in Seattle. <laughs> I mean, he's just putting it out there in as I'm a giver of no bleeps. And he's, he's just <laughs> one of the funniest people in the world. He, he calls up for reservations at restaurants in Seattle and says he's Russell Wilson. And then just shows up, <laughs> shows up with his family and they get like a special table with a little velvet rope. And he's like, ah, I got you, but I'm still a Seahawk, so you have to give it to me. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, and there, there's, where do you even begin? First of all, I, I met Michael the same way I'm meeting you. Um, I met Michael on stage. I mean, it was in front of uh, about a thousand people. So it was a little bigger, but it was one of those things where I was going out to Seattle to do a talk in front of probably about 15 people about the Brazil Olympics. And this was like January, and I was all Brazilled out. And my buddy, who was, who's a teacher um, in Seattle, who'd been working with, uh, with Michael Bennett on this initiative they were doing called Black Lives Matter in Schools, mm -hmm. said, how would you like to interview Michael Bennett on stage at Town Hall instead of speaking in the basement of Town Hall in one of their tiny subrooms? Um, and I was like, hell yeah, I'll do it. And we met on stage and got along on stage and afterwards he said, hey, um, I want to write a book called Things That Make White People Uncomfortable at Dinner. And I said, the title's a little long. Yeah, that's, um, like, that's like definitely two lines. Yeah. <laughs> I said, maybe we could shorten it. And, and that's how we ended up with this book, Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. And, it, and what we didn't expect the book to be was an explanation for why he picked up the torch, because this is January 2017, so we didn't expect the book okay. to be why he was going to pick up the torch for Kaepernick and, and sit during the anthem for a whole year. We didn't expect the book to be um, about what happened to him in Las Vegas, where he was thrown to the ground by police 
and they said they were going to blow his, his bleeping head off. Uh, they put a weapon to the back of his head. Um, he called me right after that happened, and he was in a state of shock. He didn't expect there to be a right-wing attack against him when he dared say what happened to him in Las Vegas. He didn't expect the Las Vegas Police Union to go after him. And obviously, none of us expected what just happened in Houston, where he is being absolutely railroaded, railroaded by the Houston Chief of Police, uh, by the District Attorney, um, saying that 14 months ago he pushed a 66-year-old paraplegic woman while he was trying to run out onto the field before this, after the Super Bowl. I know it's, it's wild stuff. He, he says he, had no, he has no idea what they're talking about. Uh, this, is all, this is so intensely intricate, like the, the way these charges are being thrown at him. But, but like also he's charges facing, like, like super like in the, like it, that, that they, they brought those charges on like what, like, a, like nine months? 14 months. 14 months. 14 months after the alleged incident took place, and one week before the book came out, um, which is just like a wild coincidence. And I mean, it's this effort to silence him. And it's, it's, it's absolutely terrible. And, and by the way, th this charge of pushing somebody in a wheelchair, not pushing somebody down, but pushing somebody to run out onto the field to congratulate his brother, it carries a 10-year prison sentence. So this is what they're, they're holding up in his face. Uh, they're, they're trying to destroy his character and destroy his life. And, and I raise that because what you said is so true about, because that, that is so Michael, about being like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be me. Like, I'm going to be the Michael Bennett I've always been, which is this loud, outrageous person who's hilarious, and I'm going to wield those gifts instead of making people yeah. laugh. I'm going to wield them to talk about black lives. Yeah. I'm going to wield them to speak out against police brutality. I am going to be the unassailable Michael Bennett who is unassailable because I also have this fame and this platform at the NFL. And this is, to me, about the criminal justice system saying, well, you may think you're this one person, but this is who you are in our eyes. And so then we're, you know, we're, we're dealing with it now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I feel like there are moments where people, like mainstream America or popular culture, whatever you want to call it, think that you don't become a radical person until something bad happens to you. Yeah. I feel like there is a there is a school of thought that thinks after that 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 first thing happened with Bennett, then he was like, "Oh, I have opinions about yeah. race." You know, it's like he right. like that is he'd already been thinking about that stuff. Like something I learned about Kaepernick like when I wrote about him and you know, while I didn't end up actually talking to him, I talked to lot, like pretty much everyone in his universe, in his like internal universe. And you know, like I, I talked. You uh, left, his, like his guy who like basically was like a professor yeah. at Berkeley, who basically had been like giving him things to read. There, he, I mean, his like main takeaway was like, like this isn't new like mm -hmm. he's been devouring information yeah amir loggins and, yeah and this was and yeah amir loggins like this was happening way before he ever took a knee mm -hmm. and i feel like there's like a very easy way to dismiss people by thinking like they're like one of, one of my big things and i think this is like this is like a a, a very real thing about like people of color and black americans like that I feel like popular culture likes to assume that we like to be villains mm. and we like to be like not liked. We like mm. to be like complainers that make everything like, you know, stressful and we like to be the one person on the side like the devil's advocate like it's not fun to, you know, mm. be the one person against everyone else mm. like but sometimes that gets it gets chalked up as like that's like a characteristic of being mm -hmm. black. And it's like, no, I like genuinely prefer when people like me. <laughs> you know, like that's just like a reality. But yeah. there are lots of moments where it's like I could never actually mm -hmm. do that thing or say that thing. And like thinking about a Kaepernick, thinking about like friends of mine who are writers who like, you know have had to endure the day-to-day -day trauma that is writing about police violence mm -hmm. and, and all this stuff. It's like, 
they don't want to be doing this, mm -hmm. but this is just what, like, the only other option is not doing it. Right. And there's a sense of responsibility that comes with, you know, not even calling yourself an activist, but just being, you know, a black person with a platform. Like, you can't mm -hmm. just cover your eyes and pretend oh. that stuff doesn't happen, you know? Yeah, I mean, well, why, why is there police brutality? Because it works. I mean, if every, if, if every single person who is beaten up by police turned into a fire-breathing radical, there would be no more police. It, it's just, it's a small minority of people who are, who are able to take that experience and say, I'm going to use this as a source. I'm going to bear witness to what happened to me. And that's, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you that we, that we don't really speak about how actually difficult that is to do, if you've, particularly if you've suffered some form of humiliation. One of the reasons why the right-wing blogosphere went after Michael Bennett after he uh, was thrown to the ground and had a, a police officer put a weapon to the back of his head in Las Vegas, one of the reasons that they said that he was a liar and a fraud is because video emerged after they finally uncuffed him and let him go of him shaking hands and thanking the police officers when he left. And first of all, the people criticizing Michael Bennett are not people who have ever ever had to feel a sense of fear when they've ever run across a police officer. So it's like they're coming at this from this experience of profound ignorance and lack and, and blindness. But and the, the other thing though that they don't understand is like if you're ever in a position where your life is basically in someone else's hands, even in that hyper negative level of they're yeah. holding you, and then they let you go, the flood of relief that you can feel at that moment can cause you to do extremely irrational things. Because I know for a fact that 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it was after he was shaking hands with the police officers, he's calling me up like unable to breathe, you yeah. know, because of what he just went through. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, and, and this, I, hate, I hate to bring it back to him because I, I, because it's so, Ugh, it drives me crazy when every dis discussion ha is about this, this orange golem. But, but like you bring it back to Donald Trump, I feel like one of his quote unquote contributions to our culture is this idea that it's somehow a virtue to not try to look at things through the eyes of somebody else. And so it's like you, you are not supposed to look at this world through the, idea, through the eyes of a woman who's sexually harassed or a trans person who's denied the right to you know, enter a restaurant and use the bathroom of their choice. You're not supposed to actually think to yourself of what it is like to be black and have a confrontation with the police that uh, could leave you feeling less safe around the police, not more safe. It's like actually it's a virtue to be thuggish when people say, what about my experience, which is different from yours. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about... <clears throat> it, it's, it's so interesting. I, uh, I was down in Ferguson, uh, what was that, 2014? 20, wow. I think 2014. Um, and like one of the, probably the first like political piece I wrote was like what it was like to be down in Ferguson. Wow. Um, and my, my greatest, you know, we got like tear gas, we got, you mm -hmm. know, everything. Um, and my biggest fear was not about, you know, <laughs> what the lingering effects were gonna be to me or blah, blah, blah. But like, I was like, I'm writing something, my mom's gonna see it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that my mom would see it, but it was more like, is she gonna tell me to stop or keep going? Mm -hmm. Because I just didn't, I didn't know. Cause I, I was like, it's like, like mom gonna come out and, or like, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's like, right. is that gonna come out? And initially, mom came out. Right. My mom was like, why are you there? Yeah. You know, I, my mom was like, just like, just leave immediately. She's mm -hmm. like, can I, can I get you a Uber? She, she definitely did not know what that meant. But like, yeah. but she was like, uh, uh, can I f buy you an Uber? Um, <laughs> but like a week later, she was like, you know, like, this, like someone's got to, you mm -hmm. know? And I, I, I think about that a lot when I think about, not about mm -hmm. the people who are out here, but I think about the people who raised the people who mm -hmm. are doing these things. Because so many, so many people of color, so many black people, so many women who were raised by, you know, staunch feminists, so many people who were raised by like queer activists, like, 
Like, you want, like, you know that the following generation is going to be the only thing to continue to push this thing. But mm. when they're so close, you don't want them to, you know, go through the same shit you went through, you yeah. know? And, like, I remember when my mom, like, when my mom talks about stuff like Kaepernick, thinking about to, like, you know, being able to, you know, talk very clearly about, you know, 68, talk about, you know, all the, you know, old, older political protests. Like, in her head, she was, she's like, stuff was supposed to be done with by now. Mm. We're not supposed to be repeating history. But then there's the other side where she was like, how dare I fool myself into thinking that things were like solved or mm-hmm. or, or dealt with or better, you know? Has she, is, has she had to confront that and had discussions with you about it? Well, the discussions about her expectations for what the world would look like the expecta- relative to what they are. The expectations, um, and I know lots of these black parents like who like or, or friends of mine black friends of mine who have had this kind of conversation with their parents for was this like real it's like a really disheartening like letting of the guard down that happened with Obama which you like the last thing they wanted to do was to think that everything was fine mm-hmm. but at some point they started thinking everything was fine mm-hmm. and then in the past year and a half it's like a like a very dark like i've had to like like actively make like my mother less cynical than mm-hmm. she should be because like i just like don't want her to just like grow old and mad <laughs> but i'm also like <laughs> I mean, it's like I guess know, be mad. Be, I mean, yeah, you got a lot to be say, mad about, you know. Like, like it's, it's, it's 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 a it's a hard it's a hard line to walk because yeah. those years when you felt that things were getting astronaut had gotten astronomically better, mm-hmm. like irreversibly, like was were like some of your happiest years, and I don't want to ever take that away from you. Right. But what happened after that? It's like a really, you know, and like all, all of the, like from your, from your police violence things to your, like what's happened mm-hmm. with the anthem to stuff. It's just like, it just, it's just callbacks to stuff that. And I could see how that could even be traumatic. Yeah. That level of call, like, Cause there's this, um, God, there's so much I was going to say about uh, some of the stuff that Trump's given us. Cause it's like, you can only be, like, what were you saying about like, you can only like, if not, you basically said, if not now, when, if not us, who? Yeah. It's like, it's got to be somebody who does this. And it's like, we got, you know, teachers striking in Oklahoma and walking out. I mean, that, that's amazing. Getting, like, not as much. No, not nearly as much. As it should. It's incredible. But we, what it is, a West Virginia, I mean, Kentucky. I mean, th- these are things that I certainly wondered if I would ever see in my lifetime. Oklahoma is the only state in the country in 2008 where every congressional district voted for John McCain and Sarah Palin. <laughs> It's the only state in the country yeah. that you have a nationwide, I mean, a, a statewide teacher strike. And, and or just the mere fact that sports itself um, has become this site of resistance mm-hmm. is a remarkable thing. Um, you know, right up the road here, a couple stops away on the train up at Columbia University where you went to school, right? You went to Columbia? Grad school. Grad school at Columbia. They kicked me out. And they kicked you out? That sucks, man. <laughs> I, I I'm sorry. Out. <laughs> I, <laughs> I owe them all the money. <laughs> they all the money. <laughs> That's what matters. They, <laughs> they, if, if anyone has a hookup, let me know. <laughs> well, when, when there was a, a student strike there um, against the war in Vietnam and building occupations, mm-hmm. uh, the athletes were actually enlisted to form these reactionary pickets around the buildings to keep out oh, yeah. food, to keep out resources, to try to starve out the activist students. And, and you fast forward today, and we're actually at many, many institutions looking to the athletes, which is kind of a wild thing. I know at my school growing up, the, the athletes were where you thought of as being like the most reactionary part of the campus, is where the athletes were. And to see that change and that shift, well, and to see the anthem of all things become this space of activism, that's a hell of a change. But Well, I, I will say this, I know we wanna, we wanna take some oh, yes, we questions wanna... and stuff, but I, what I will say, because I, I, that is something I've thought about, like, when you really look at, like, 
we live in a world where we're like we're craving leadership mm -hmm. and like you know leaders used to be you know you know preachers and religious figures and blah 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 like mm -hmm. we 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 don't really live in that world anymore um the world in which entertainers and sports figures people with the greatest reach mm -hmm. like the fact that they've become our foremost leaders it actually like like it actually makes sense and it's good mm -hmm. when it's the right person matched with the right cause like it's often the wrong person with the wrong cause and no one knows what they're talking about and it's terrible because mm -hmm. like some assistant was like go on twitter and talk about this and you know but you know when you think about the reach and you think about the type of person and like it's i'm not mad at um i'm not mad at where we are with like a group like athletes mm -hmm. um because they you know fandom is real and mm -hmm. fandom on the surface crosses all ideological and political boundaries so when you get an athlete to conf again confront person x that has that fandom about a team or a person they can actually like bring some people over to the right side you mm -hmm. know like because like i always used to think it like when i worked at grantland i was like i i, ab I absorbed all these like diehard Boston Bill Simmons sports fans. And like every four months I like write about race. And I'm like, this is the first time they've ever read anything mm -hmm. that wasn't about the, the Celtics mm -hmm. or the Red Sox. Yeah, say. And so like they're forced to at least confront it. Mm -hmm. So I'm at least putting them in a position to decide That's if they deal. like it or not. Sports you can know, sever segregation. Yeah, like whether and like... Yes, there is a world in which 100% of those people like, are just like, this isn't for me. Mm -hmm. But like, I get like 5 to 10% every thing I write. That's, like a, that's a net positive for take society. It. So I'll take that. I'll yeah, take, take that. it. Take you it, know? man. You're, you're puncturing privilege. Absolutely. That's a beautiful thing. Cool. Well, before we go to the audience, I want to end actually with this, this quote. Um, and it's by somebody who there's an exhibit up here. Uh, which people should see when, when, the music, when the historical society is open, it's for Jackie Robinson. And this quote's not in the exhibit, although the exhibit's amazing. But at the end of his life, this is what Jackie Robinson said, this person who's lauded as a hero, this person who's lauded as a heroic black Republican uh, by, by Michael Steele, former head of the, the RNC. Uh, this is what Jackie Robinson said. He said, I cannot stand and sing the anthem. I cannot salute the flag. I know that I am a black man in a white world. In 1972, in 1947, at my birth in 1919, I know that I never had it made. So that's an incredible. Quote. These issues, yeah, these issues aren't new that athletes are raising, and in some respect, it's because the actual objective issue of racism is still with us. It should actually give us heart and hope that the fight has not ended, either on the field or off. So, thank you. And we, we have time for any questions or comments. I guess uh, the, my, my one ask is that folks keep your questions or comments at under two minutes or so, so we can make sure as many people as possible. My ask is that they are questions. Yeah. <laughs> Get to hear from as many folks as possible, and um, also two Brooklyn loggers to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> two Brooklyn loggers. Uh, quickly, I'll say um, I want to do two things, but quickly, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the times we're in. You know, you could have this guy be your mentor or that person, but the last 15 years we've had the Iraq War. We had the 2008 uh, stock market crash and how that is still affecting us. We had Black Lives Matter. We had all this stuff. So I think that had a lot to do with it. The second thing I'll say, what the hell is going on with baseball? Where are the baseball athletes? They're saying nothing, it seems. Yeah. You want to go first or second? You go second. First. I would like to go second. <laughs> go second. Okay. <laughs> 
I mean, I'll just say first and just, is this a, the Iraq war thing is really important. I think we, we absolutely take for granted the impact that it's had on consciousness that this country has been at war for effectively 16 years and what that's done to a generation of people and what that's done to our expectations. Just a quick story. I, I wrote this book with John Carlos, the 1968 Olympian. And, and, and when John, after he raised his fist, he got a ton of the most disgusting, violent hate mail you could possibly imagine. And he showed me the mail. He kept it over the years. And so he showed it to me and I read it. And one of the things that was so striking about it, thinking about people like Colin Kaepernick, Michael Bennett today, um, is that for all the things they said to John Carlos, for all the ways they called him unpatriotic, for all the racist vitriol that was thrown on him, no one called him anti-military. So here he is raising his fist during the anthem while it's playing, during the Olympics, and no one says that he's hurting the troops. No one says he's anti, because it's almost like it wasn't in the hate, the hate dictionary at the time, the hate thesaurus. It wasn't there for people to access, to say. Yeah. And today, that's now the absolute, you know, the, that's the, the reflex. It's to say, you're, it doesn't matter how many hashtags vets for Kaepernick come up. It doesn't matter how many veterans say, well, I, I went and fought just so people could ex exercise this free speech. It doesn't matter because it, it's, the, it's the stick that they hit these athletes with when they dare speak out that they're somehow hurting the military. Also as if the military is somehow above all criticism. And heaven forfend we criticize the military. And it's, it's a real problem. So I'm glad you, you invoke that. And there's a book coming out by Howard Bryant called The Heritage, which yeah. is about the intersection of black protest and our time of perpetual war that I highly recommend. I have a quick thought about Facebook, um, which is I think a very dangerous thing that has happened is that lots of very intelligent older people's introduction to the internet was on Facebook. Um, my mother planned her high school graduation, and when that happened, I got like 132 friend requests from all of her high school classmates, which is fine. But then they all started to share with me things that were fake news. And I was like, y'all are all like brilliant, but you don't know what's real and what's not because your intro to social media and internet is in the fake news era. And I think that's like dangerous. Like yeah. I, I always used to think that was something that happened, you know, in the, you know, nether regions of America, but it was like, it started happening in my backyard, my backyard being Facebook Messenger. And um, it was terrifying because I was like, yo, like you have like a PhD and you were sending me an article that is just just not real. But you like you don't know, you know, because like you don't you haven't been able to tease you you, you don't you don't have the sa the internet savvy. You have the real life savvy, which is a more important savvy, but when it comes right. to the internet, like all you see it's what's happening on the news feed, and it's all wrong, and it's all bad, but you don't know that. And like we used to just chalk that up to, you know, people getting lost in, you know, Andy Borowitz articles on the New Yorker. But like it's gotten much worse than that. Like they haven't gotten funnier, but like they're like still, you know, it's gotten worse than that. So like, you know, do I have any comments about Cambridge Analytica? No. Um, but Facebook, it's you know, it's. It's, it's, it's terrifying. And I, I think you said baseball, right? Was it baseball or Facebook? But I agree with, the, I agree with you about everything on Facebook. Um, I just want to talk about Facebook. Yeah, well, about Facebook. Anyone else going to raise their hand? Yeah, I was going to say anything about Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> wore his dad's suit today. To, oh, my God. In, interviewed by two 284-year-old so senators leading the committee, asking him about Facebook. It was like my worst Thanksgiving <laughs> watching... It was like when you wear your dad's suit to prom. He yeah. Looks so, he looks so scared. And they're, and they're asking him about the interwebs. I will say that there was, there was one player who took a knee. His name was Bruce Maxwell uh, for, for the Oakland A's last fall. I've asked a lot of baseball people, where's the protest in baseball? And what they always come back to, and it's a frustrating answer, but 
the fact that so many different people have said it to me just gives it credence. Is they're just like, look, this this is a sport that's based on tradition, and our you know the same reason why we don't flip bats is in the same reason why we didn't like Ken Griffey Jr. with his hat on backwards is the same reason why we don't stand we wouldn't stand for any protest, and it's frustrating. This particularly frustrating thing is is just those urban youth. Yeah, is how <laughs> coded it all is in 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 anti blackness and it, it's it's uh it's frustrating but as we saw in the NFL who the hell ever would have thought that the NFL would become this blistering site of dissent so i mean even saying it now it's it's almost unbelievable so you never know who would have thought teachers in Oklahoma <laughs> that's true we're not in charge yeah we're not totally not in charge uh I guess talk, thinking about different factors that could lead to different sports leagues being more progressive or having different says on politics, uh, one interesting thing about the NBA in these days is that the top stars of the NBA, like Curry, Durant, LeBron, are getting paid probably more by their shoe brands that endorse them than by the teams that you know, employ them. Do you think that could like, have an impact in the way that they choose to speak out? And like the dynamic between like being more loyal possibly to like a multinational corporation like Nike than you know the Cavs or something can impact their politics and the way this plays out in the NBA. I mean, you know, I think I think brands have a lot more to worry about than a team. Like I I think um, you know a place like Under Armour that employs lots of different types of people and it's in lots of different sports and is and is you know headquarters is in a very different place than um the bay you know yeah. i think they have a lot more potentially riding on their athletes staying in line than act in the actual team so you know i think i think i think it actually um the teams um a team being less comfortable with their athletes speaking out is in more hot water than the actual brands because I think brands have like so much, so many other things to think about than this one player, even their marquee players. But you know, you hope that brands, you know, I think many brands get um, caught off guard in terms of who they've hired. You know, a couple years in. I think Steph Curry could be an example. I don't think yeah. most people would have thought Steph Curry would be out here. I think, you know, you hire Steph Curry as like a, a proto Russell Wilson. Um, and now Russell Wilson's not even Russell Wilson. Russell That's Wilson. one of the things. Sierra got yeah. him a makeover, got him some nice jeans, and, <laughs> and he's, he's <laughs> gave him a out. book. <laughs> gave him a book. <laughs> but, you know, so like, you know. <laughs> When you give them that $100 million contract, like you, you, you hope that they know who they've, they've signed up for, but, uh, um, but yeah. Yeah, I agree with everything Remember, said. I'd, I'd add that you know, the, the, the first generation, of course, that, that had shoe money as a hedge against just NBA money was the Jordan generation. Yeah. And that didn't necessarily lead to a generation of outspoken athletes. If anything, it made them more brand conscious and more conscious of not speaking out in the hope of more commercial opportunity, um, I think that uh, it's interesting. I, I think that the reason why you have more of these athletes speaking out in the NBA is less about shoes and more straight up about the Black Lives Matter movement and black consciousness. I mean, I, I interviewed the, the Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, a couple of Black Lives Matter activists in Sacramento about people might have heard what they did recently in making a um, a picket around the Sacramento Kings Stadium after the killing of Stephon oh, yeah. Clark, yeah. and they kept all the fans out. And I asked, I said, like, what what was that about? Like, why go to the basketball arena? Like, why was that the instinct? And she, this amazing woman, Tanya Faison, who started the chapter there, she said it came from the march itself. Like, this is where we go. We go to the, where the players are. We go to where, in a place like Sacramento, uh, I mean, you're going to go to the state house or you're going to go to the basketball arena. They chose the basketball arena, and they actually did make more of an impact in terms of news and th than they would have made otherwise uh, going to the, st the very state house of California. You got time for one more? Oh, I've got time. Got I've got um, 
I got to leave at 8.30 to catch a train, but that, that gives me time to hear from as many folks as possible. Gotcha. I was, yeah. uh, Dave, it's a pleasure to be here. If, if I, even if I weren't a sports fan, if I were just like uh, a Catholic lefty who was you know, kind of influenced by the Barragut brothers, I would still love and get a lot out of your podcast. It's, the, it's the, one of the best places to listen to progressive thought. And, uh, it's I, a good you know, podcast. Thank oh, it's you, a Robert. fantastic podcast. What's the podcast called? It's called Edge of Sports. <laughs> We, 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 we do it in this dude's one-bedroom apartment. It's very glamorous. But, um, you know, it's, I'll listen to the show, and then I'll start following people on Twitter that you've interviewed. So I, I thank you Thanks. for the work that you're doing. Um, you brought up, like, growing up uh, as a sports fan in the 90s and the 2000 aughts, uh, but, like, a little before that, the late 80s, yeah, was... uh, Dennis Rodman, before he was a cartoon character, had stuff to say about race and how Larry Bird was portrayed in the media versus how... Uh, black athletes were portrayed in the media, and Isaiah Thomas, you know, who, there's a lot wrong with how yeah. Isaiah Thomas has kind of lived his life since then, <laughs> but he came in as captain of that team, as leader of that team, and uh, tried to stand up for Rodman, but the whole discussion then became about whether or not we liked Larry Bird. So I wonder, do you remember that incident? Do you have any, either of you have any thoughts about um, how that was covered and, you know, maybe the opportunity that was lost then? Oh, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for the kind words about the podcast. I grew up hating Larry Bird because I grew up a diehard Knicks fan and so and I also hated Larry Bird because I would go I was a, a serious like go around not that I was good but I was serious but I was a serious basketball player uh, growing up in the city again that doesn't mean I was good I was serious yeah where's like, the tape I want the tape oh dude the tape <laughs> the tape was like learning that like uh that like yeah. Kenny, yeah, seriously. That like Kenny Anderson, uh, who went on to play in the NBA and whatnot. That Kenny Anderson was from Left Rack City, and he was in ninth grade, and he was already his All City guard. So I'm taking the train to Left Rack City to try to find Hell a way yeah. to play, and we played against each other uh, in Left Rack City. It was really, and, and then I got to tell that story on a stage with Kenny Anderson. Um, in front of Georgia Tech's finest. Yeah, in front of this group of NBA rookies uh, at the NBA Rookie Symposium. And I said, Kenny Anderson, I always wanted to thank you because when everybody there was like, oh man, don't let that white boy play, you were like, nah, man, just let him play. And then you blocked my shot like every time. <laughs> and, and I always appreciated that you gave me the chance to block that shot. And I said, and I said to him, I said, and I just want you to know that's a memory that is just tattooed on my brain and I will never forget it. And Kenny Anderson looked at me and he goes, Wow, um, yeah, I don't remember that at all. And I was just like, and I was just like, wow, yeah, sometimes there's an imbalance in terms of what's an important moment in somebody's life. <laughs> You're like, not. same, same, I don't remember it either. Yeah, but the point is, when I would go on the court, the point of it was that people would always be like, hey, who's going to guard Larry Bird? And I was, I hated that so much because I hated Bird for what he did to the Knicks, and I hated that he was my, my white avatar uh, in basketball. So I absolutely remember when that happened and I was I was really young and I was still like yeah yeah screw Larry Bird you go you go you go Isaiah take him down a notch and and it um there, there's a great documentary ESPN documentary about the bad boys and it it uh, it doesn't go into it too deeply, but it talks about like the ferocious backlash against them just raising the idea that maybe he was overrated or at least held in a higher esteem than he otherwise would have been because of the color of his skin. And it's so interesting to me because I think this is how sports media has changed. I think if that happened today, there would be like hashtag overrated bird. You know, there would be yeah. like actual solidarity with Isaiah and Dennis Rodman that maybe they would have been able to draw strength from instead of feeling so chagrined. They basically had to go on an apology tour just for daring to broach the subject. I remember um, in my middle school and high school years when I went from a all black school to um, like a pretty diverse school, but we were playing against white schools. Um, my mom, who uh, <laughs> she, she had a she had many sayings, but one of her saying was that every good team had a three point shooting white boy. <laughs> And I was just like, good to know. But then, <laughs> yeah, but then often guard him. Out yeah, but then often I would get, uh, I would end up having to guard that person, and yeah. my mom would just be um, in the bleachers, just like looking at me like this. She's like, he better not get six points. <laughs> 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 like just like because my mom literally was like respected 
Larry Bird harder than any other. My mom was like, I don't know how he's doing it. Wow. <laughs> so he must be the best yeah. basketball player of all time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I grew up thinking like Larry Bird was a god because my yeah. mom was like, yo, like, yeah, Mike, Dominique, I was like, all, my magic, but like, I don't, Man. I don't know what it is, but like, he, he must be the greatest basketball player of all time. <laughs> he's, just, he's the guy who ripped out my heart. That's how I <laughs> knew of him. It's any. I, I'll just throw out there if, if any women have questions. So, so we use gender uh, balance. Look at all those hands fall. Uh, this is time for one more because I have to pee. I think we're doing our best. Hey guys, I'm curious if any in any of your work or reporting you have maybe learned or talked to some people to see how this conversation has trickled down to the high school level and how that's yeah. playing out. You know, sort of in more everyday life as opposed to you know LeBron. I I have a little, and I know you have a lot. Oh, so yeah. um, one thing that I um, when I was when I was um, when I was writing my Kaepernick piece, I interviewed um, the woman who was I think she's CEO of that organization Rise. Yeah. Um, which stands for. Something, 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 something. Um, Quality. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's it's basically um, it's basically um, it's it's like the foremost organization that's like is the educating and telling like teaching athletes how best to use their influence. It's like a very wonderful organization, and one of the things that I talked to her about was the almost like like unabashed like 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 drive that these high school football players and basketball players had which like I think you can you can kind of like when you in the past two months think about the um someone should write about this but like when you think about the the drive and the savvy that uh, teens high schoolers have had post Parkland and like some mm -hmm. people are like very thrown like, like taken aback, but like it makes perfect sense because they understand media and like the internet better than all of us in this room combined. Like um, these high school athletes are the same way, you mm -hmm. know? And that's something that she told me like nine months ago. She was like, these athletes, they're not worried about, you know, whether or not this is gonna mess up their scholarships or something like they, they want to follow in the footsteps mm -hmm. of their heroes, and they think that it's right, and their parents are proud of them. Like mm -hmm. it was that—that that was like the three three-headed monster. Like, and you know, as someone who remembers being a teenager, I was like, well, if my mom's on my side, I'm probably going to do it. You know, mm -hmm. like because like everything else was like, you know, like I was like, if my mom's on my side, and it's like not, like she's not going to put me in harm's way. So, if this like rebellious thing that I'm doing, but my, I got my mom, hell yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think I think you're getting that from from a lot of um, a lot of worlds, like with teenagers, high school athletics, high school activism, um, and the like. So yeah, that that that's been my experience. And uh, she was mentioning that like they've been talking to more and more high school athletes from all all sports. Yeah, my experience is that it's impacted high school athletes so strongly. Like this idea when, when my generation was coming up, this idea of being like, why are you an athlete? It's because you like sports and because of status. And now this idea of like, well, that's not enough anymore. And status, for status' sake, is not enough anymore. So what are you using this for? And the two big discussions that are happening is one, are you fighting um, against racial inequity? And the second has to do with Me Too. And our athletes, instead of being seen in a campus situation as being the people that you avoid at a party for fear that they are, this is the, the sexual assault crowd, that they're actually going to not be bystanders to sexual assault. And certainly, that's, that's more than Me Too. This to me goes back to Steubenville and the case that happened there yeah. with the high school team. And I've just seen a huge change since Steubenville. Like, I've been brought in to talk about consent to football players and what, what affirmative consent means. And the, the frightening thing with these discussions, first of all, is, is two things. Uh, the first is, I mean, <laughs> even crazy compared to when I was coming up, like how much alcohol young people consume is wild. They smoke less cigarettes, 
which is a good thing, but they drink so much is the first thing. And the second thing is just like not having ever been taught like what consent means, but this idea that administrators and individuals on the team want them to learn and, and post Steubenville and want them to be actually seen as a force on campus that, that is not going to stand for what athletes used to stood for. And so, I mean, I, I think we're viewing something really profound and someone absolutely should write about that. I think that this is a book that is going to happen about a generation of athletes who see themselves as being, <laughs> as being like soldiers for social justice as opposed to people who view sports as being for status, for status' sake. One more. Do you have time for, time for two more? We might have time for two more. Yeah, we do two more. I ramble, so. No. Uh, I saw My a, guy a, on the a, aisle. A, a, there was a, a woman who had her hand up. I also have to pee. Oh, in the back. Oh. I'll deal. Um, I'm interested in this intersection of sports and activism, and I put it in quotes, philanthropy. Um, and mm -hmm. I think especially last fall, we saw the NFL essentially what seemed like buying off mm -hmm. the players with this $100 million fund that they were going to be giving it to like the ACLU and oh, sort of yeah. like all of these like pro Black Lives Matters organizations. And I feel like it all kind of died down. And so my question is more of an informative one. Like, what have you heard? What have you seen? Um, and if you can even maybe provide some historical references of where you've seen this intersection of sports and philanthropy and activism. I'll, do the, I'll say that Colin Kaepernick's great contribution to uh, the building of a radical current in sports is figuring out how you build a bridge between philanthropy and activism. Because philanthropy has been the historic out for athletes. It goes well before this NFL situation. It goes back for as long as athletes have had disposable income, which if you think about it, only goes back about 40 to yeah, 50 years. Yeah. So we're talking about like a very short time frame. And because before that, athletes didn't make that much money. Um, unions, they, they, they help. Um, and, and so, but moving forward, what, what, what Kaepernick did was he, when, when he said he was going to give away that million dollars and specifically targeted organizations like Asada's Daughters, like building a health clinic at Standing Rock, that were very specifically not about the old philanthropy, but about trying to actually support activism through philanthropy. Yeah, I think that's changed not, not, things. Not blindly. Like, I mean, right. he said that, but like, like every, every month, like, or like every time they, they rolled out a new list of organizations, like it was clear that they weren't just like, these are the 10 things that are popular right now. Like it was mm -hmm. clear they'd been researched. There mm -hmm. were things that it wasn't just the first 10, it was the 10 best. Like it, it was, it was very, it was very, it was very clear to the outsider. And I think a group in Atlanta too, that yeah. works with uh, immigrant youth. Yeah. Who's yeah. That? Yeah. Yeah. And it, that's our problem today. Acronyms. Yeah, <laughs> acronyms. <laughs> Rise. Um, but, but, and, and so, so historically, it's not a long history period in terms of philanthropy. I think that what you saw, this is absolutely what NFL owners have tried to do is attempt to buy off the protests with what really at the end is $87 million, which is the price of like one punter per team. Uh, they're going to stop this horrific, for them, PR disaster of players protesting. But it's not going to stop the protest. That's the main thing. I don't know about, with, with, about Rember, but I, everywhere I go to talk about this, people always ask, well, what's next? What's going to happen? Will athletes keep protesting? And to me, the, the answer is like, that, that will not be decided by athletes. Mm -hmm. That's going to be decided by the police. That's going to be decided by how people respond to the police. It's going to be by what happens off the athletic field, not what, what athletes choose to do on the field. And if we think about it just in terms of what athletes do, then protest becomes a spectator sport. Also rises the Ross Initiative in Sports for Equality. Mm. Stephen Ross, the owner of the Dolphins. Of the Dolphins, that's right. That's what Google told me. Yeah. I didn't remember. Rise. One more question. Do we have time? I'll let the, you, you decide. We, we, we fortunately don't have to be that. Thanks. Person. The question I have is all these people came down on Colin about kneeling and they turned it into him being against the national anthem. Why is the national anthem played before a sporting event if it's such a sacred thing anyway? Mm-hmm. 
That's the right question. That's. It's like like a kind of racist. Well, yeah, listen to the whole thing. It gets kind of yeah. racist. It's crazy racist. It's a crazy racist. And I won't song. lie. It's like you know, it, it's, it's catchy. Like I, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I like it. Like I mean, it's like no lyrics. I'm like it's instrument. The instrumental, I can freestyle to it. But like, I mean, M- Marvin Gaye killed it. Yeah, he killed it. But I like, feel like they should have stopped it after Marvin Gaye did it at I the '83 NBA All Star Game. Like it gets kind of as like. It's crazy. Anything racist. that was made 150 year old, 50 years ago, like, gets kind of racist at some point. But, <laughs> yeah, like, there's a world in which we should um, just, like, do America the Beautiful, Ray Charles I mean, version. It's, it's a wild thing. It, 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 it becomes, it starts really during uh, World War II. And then this is the, 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 so you've got this whole half a century of organized sports without, uh, having to pay this sort of patriotic tribute. But, but then it, you get this weird thing, because it's like, OK, World War II ends, but the Cold War begins. So it's like this institutionalization of a permanent state of war, and a permanent state of this idea that we have enemies, that we need a military budget, that we need a military industrial complex, and that sports is going to be seen as a partner to that. And so that's where the anthem just then stays, because then the Cold War ends, but then, you know, we got the New World Order, and we got Whitney Houston, again, slaying it, but crushed, <laughs> crushing it. But then, like, for, for a new generation, the anthem again, and then, of course, since, uh, since 9-11, it's, you know, it's become something institutionalized. Well, don't forget about degree. Roseanne grabbing her crowd. Oh, Roseanne, Donald Trump's hero, yes. Um, yes. Is that a Cubs game? Oh, Carl Lewis, Carl Lewis. Well, but that wasn't on sing. purpose. <laughs> Leave Carl alone. Was, um, this is so cool. I met Carl Lewis at a time where my friend, who's a track and field fanatic, was having a serious depressive episode, and, and I mentioned it to Carl Lewis, and he said, call him up, and he talked on the phone with my friend for like 20 Shut minutes. And, and so I can't even mention Carl Lewis without... There's Wait, is he good. here? No. <laughs> Come on I'm out. just saying that... There's some good people out there. I have to think about stuff like that when I'm feeling hopeless because, you know, there's some That's good true. people in this world. And we got time for one more, or we... Do you have to go? Shake a couple hands before you get out of here. Okay, I should... I, yeah, I should we should, you should do go. that. Well, oh, this dude has had his hand up, like, the whole time. What, Let's, what, do what's that, Let's do it. Let's do it. Yo, yo th- throw, those, throw those bars up. What Just you got? What you beginning. got? So uh, I think you guys can probably speak to this. How do you think the proliferation of uh, like sports outlets, you know, the Ringer, Grandland, Players Tribune, Undefeated, how has that helped advance athletes' narrative? And then sort of on the flip side of that, how has like barstool sports, um, places where people can go to get sports independent of political coverage? I'm excited to get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. How is that sort of... I don't have a job, so I can say whatever I want. Um, I... um, I happen to be a pro. Um, to the outsider, I think the players, a place like the Players Tribune, where if you don't know, like this is where athletes get to write mm-hmm. their own manifestos. Um, I mean, they're, other people are <laughs> helping them <laughs> write this. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, I, 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 I like. You know, I'm not a I'm not a, a hard J journalist. You know, like I, I I I think there are worlds in which you know you cut out middlemen and you let people tell their own stories. Um, Ninety nine out of a hundred times, those stories are less interesting when um, those people tell their own stories. Like they're still they're, it's not replacing good journalism, um, but you know every now and then you get something like. Steve Francis telling his own story. I'm like, yeah. yo, that was the greatest thing I've ever read. Yeah, that was no great. one else should ever get to tell the Steve Francis story, but Steve yeah. Francis. Um, and, and my friends, my my son's friend's mom, who he uh, dated, she, she got some great stories too. But that's not on which the is a, tribute. Next week at the Brooklyn Star. <laughs> next week, <laughs> <laughs> people who dated Steve Francis. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, yeah. You get half off. Um, <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I'm on team, like, uh, I, I think the written word is mm-hmm. fighting everything else um, in, this, in this media universe. So, like, I'm never going to 
come down on more things getting written. Mm -hmm. I want people to continue to double down on people writing and things being written because we're fighting a, a, a really losing battle right now. So like, mm -hmm. I'm definitely not on team less outlets. I'm on team more outlets with people exploring different universes to monetize it and stay afloat and write about it in different ways. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. Um, yeah. More, more places. Hell yeah. Th th there's always going to be pl a place in the world for a beautifully crafted sentence, as long as there's human beings. And I'll believe that till I croak. And so I want everybody here to fight for the written word. Absolutely. Because we need it. Because we're not going to change the world one meme at a time. Uh, we're going to do it by actually, I think, the art of convincing other the people around us. And the thing that I love about writing so much is that you don't have to be good at it to do it. But every time you do it, you become better. It's practice, and you and you gotta. The people who like who care about writing like care about each sentence. If you don't care about writing, all you want is the thing to get from the beginning to the end. If you care exactly. about writing, you care about every single word that ends up. So I don't care where you work, but if you live by that mindset, yeah, and you care about every word and every sentence having merit and like having meaning, then like I'm on your. I'm on your team, regardless of where you work. Damn straight. Remember Brown, everybody. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> so, so we do okay for the first time meeting? First time. This is all right? Also, uh, cheer for him. This no, is Dave Zirin. Right. <laughs> Great man.